to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ to one of the greatest enemies of christianity the lord and savior jesus christ said saul Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul responded by saying, Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And with the right heart and intent, Saul said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. We welcome you today to our study of cases of conversion in the New Testament. We're thinking about one of the most serious of all subjects, what must a person do to be saved? And so friend, we encourage you to tune in and open your hearts and minds with us as we study this wonderful subject from the Word of God together. When you think about the example of Saul as an example of how to be saved, there are so many things that make Saul a, a practical lesson for us to learn. First and foremost, Saul stands out as a wonderful example of salvation because like all of us, Saul had a sinful past he had to deal with. I've had sin to deal with, you've had sin to deal with, anyone who's of an accountable age has had to deal with sin. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and no doubt Saul serves as an example of that. Do you remember the words of 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15? Saul said, or Paul at this time said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Like men and women today, Paul had to deal with the sting and the overwhelming effects of sin. In fact, Paul had lived a pretty ugly past as it related to sin. 1 Timothy 1 verse 13, Paul said, I was formerly a blasphemer, an insolent man, and injurious to the cause of Christ. You, you can think in the New Testament about what Paul did that would make him feel this way. For example, in Acts chapter 7, Saul is holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen to death. He's an accessory to their murder. We open up to Acts chapter 8 and the Bible says that Saul is wreaking havoc on the church, dragging men and women to prison. In Acts chapter 9, he has official letters from the synagogue, from the high priest, that if he finds any who are of the way, he can bind them and take them to Jerusalem and likely some of those would even lose their life for the cause of Christ. And so as we think today about Saul of Tarsus who eventually becomes the great Apostle Paul, let's realize we can relate to Saul because like Saul, all of us have felt the sting and the weight of sin. The wages of sin, it's death. Romans 6, 23, My sins have gone over my head, the psalmist said, like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me to bear. Psalm 37 and Psalm 38. And so when we think about sin, we can relate to Paul because Paul had done a lot of horrible things in his life. And friend, listen carefully. Sometimes I hear people say, I'm too bad for God to save. I I've done too many things that are wrong. I I've lived a reprobate life and there's no way God could save me. If God can save Saul, I promise you God can save you. And each of us need to realize and take comfort in the fact that yes, regardless of what we've done, we can be saved. Now, Jesus spoke to Paul. What, go in the city what, and I'll tell you what you must do. But you know, as we think about what Saul had to do to be saved, he first and foremost had to be confronted by Christ and he had to hear the voice of Christ. Literally, Christ spoke to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. For men and women to be saved, they've got to turn their ear and their attention to the voice of God and the voice of Christ. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Today, if you will hear His voice, the psalmist said, Do not harden your hearts. Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. And the Scripture says in Hebrews 11, verse 6, Without faith, 
it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so just as Jesus or just as Saul turned his attention to the voice of Jesus and the Word of God for men and women to be saved, we've got to do the same thing. Friend, listen carefully. On matters of salvation, where do I need to look? The Bible. This book has the way of salvation. The Gospel is God's power to save. Romans 1 verse 16, I don't need books of men. I don't need opinions of men. I don't need commentaries or catechisms or all these doctrines written by men. The Bible alone is able to save us. That, that's why God wrote the Bible. Do you remember John 20 verses 30 and 31? The Scripture says this, Truly, many other signs Jesus did in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but Listen to this. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. And so to be saved, I've got to give attention to the Word of God. It's the only way, the only book that can save me. But friend, like Saul, let's realize to be saved, we've got to believe in Jesus. Not enough just to hear the Word of God. I've got to commit to the fact that Jesus is Lord in Christ. He's the Savior of the world. Did Saul do that? You bet he did. Can you imagine walking down the, the road to Damascus there and he hears that voice, Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. Lord, what would you have me to do? To be saved, just like Saul, you've got to recognize Jesus is your Lord. You've got to recognize He's the Savior. He's the Christ. He's the only one who can bring salvation to you by His death, burial, and resurrection. You know, when we talk about believing, we sure want to emphasize, just as the Scripture does, that to be saved, you've got to believe in Jesus as the only way of salvation. Another account of salvation in the book of Acts is found in Acts chapter 8, and we've got Philip teaching the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. And they're traveling down the road, and he's been teaching them about Christ. And in the distance, he's heard about Christ, how to be saved, how to get into Christ, and he says, look, here's water, what doth hinder me? And do you remember Peter's answer, or Philip's answer? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Acts chapter 8, verse number 37. John 8, 24, Jesus said, Unless, here's the condition, Unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. Now friend, I also want to mention to you today that the Bible teaches while belief is essential, salvation doesn't stop. Belief is not the only thing you've got to do to be saved. Some people say, well, all you've got to do to be saved is believe. That's not what the Scripture says. In fact, I want to direct your attention to a passage in the book of James. Would you look in James chapter 2 with me? And I want you to notice what the Scripture says about the idea of faith only in James chapter 2, verse number 24. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. What does God say about faith alone? You know, I, I hear it a lot. I hear people say, you want to be saved? All you've got to do is believe in Jesus. Just trust Jesus and you'll be saved. Wait a minute now. The only time the Bible says faith alone, God says we see that a man is not justified by faith alone. There's something we must do to obey the gospel, and the Scripture clearly teaches what that is. Now, I want to, I want to mention something else, and I think it relates directly to Saul of Tarsus and his account of salvation. Sometimes along with the ideas of faith only, I hear people talk about saying the sinner's prayer. Uh, for example, people say, you know, you need to say the sinner's prayer, meaning that you need to say, Lord Jesus, I recognize you as Savior. I put my trust in you for salvation. I ask you now to come into my heart and save me. And they're usually in that in Jesus' name. Is that really what the Bible teaches about salvation? I remember specifically I was preaching at a, a gospel meeting at a place one time and I'd, I'd taught from the Scripture that you don't find the sinner's prayer anywhere in the Bible. I'd said you can look from Genesis 1-1 to the very last verse, verse in Revelation 22. And nowhere in the pages of the Bible do you find the sinner's prayer. And after the meeting was over, a, a lady made a way beeline right to me. She said, Preacher, she said, I, I heard what you said about the sinner's prayer. 
I said, well, that's good. I hope you'll check it in your Bible. She said, I'm going to go home and ask my pastor. I said, well, you do that. You go home and ask him, and whatever verses he gives you, I want you to bring those back tomorrow night, and let's talk about them. So the next night comes, and as soon as she gets there, she makes a beeline right for me. She says, preacher, she said, I asked my pastor, and she used those words loosely, as you understand. She said, I asked my pastor about the sinner's prayer, and he said, you was right. And I told him he was a liar. Friend, that person had been teaching for probably multiplied years to a whole lot of people that to be saved, all you've got to do is say the sinner's prayer. And if there was ever a person who said a whole lot of sinner's prayers, I'll guarantee you it was Saul of Tarsus. Look in your Bible in Acts chapter 9, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verses 11 and 12. So the Lord said to him, Arise, this is to Ananias, Arise, go to the street called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Watch this now. For behold, he is praying. We think about Saul of Tarsus and, and what he did from the time the Lord confronted him until his sins were washed away in the waters of baptism, Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. And was Saul praying at that time? Oh, there's no doubt. Saul realized he was a sinner. He realized he was in need of salvation and he was praying. But was he saved at the point of prayer? Ananias still had to go to him. Still had to tell him what to do to have his sins washed away. And thus, as we've said, in the Scripture, the Bible does not teach the sinner's prayer. You don't find it anywhere in Scripture like you hear people saying today. That's not a part of God's plan of salvation. Now, let me also give you some examples just by way of reference to show that to be saved, it's not enough just to believe or say the sinner's prayer. In fact, there are people who did believe and were still lost. Let me give you one clear example. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Jesus said, If you confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll also deny you before my Father who is in heaven. And so if I confess Christ, He'll confess me. If I deny Christ, He'll deny me. Now think about these words. John chapter 8, verse 30. From the teaching of Jesus, the Bible says, Many believed in Him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess him, lest they be put out of the synagogue. What about these people? John 12, verse 42. What about those people who believed in Christ, but wouldn't confess him? If belief alone is true, at the point of their belief, they should have been saved. And yet Jesus has already said, if you won't confess me, you won't be saved. Because of the Pharisees, they wouldn't confess him. Could they be saved? Is belief alone enough there to save him? No, just recognizing Jesus is the Son of God. The Scriptures do not teach that's all you've got to do to be saved, and we learn that from the account of Saul of Tarsus. Well, what else did Saul have to do? There's no doubt. It was obvious that Saul had to be penitent and had to repent of the things he had done. Acts chapter 9, verse number 6, Lord, what would you have me to do? At that point, Paul realizes what I'm doing is not right. I need to make changes. What are those changes? Acts chapter 9, verse 11, Saul is praying about God's will to be done, no doubt, and for changes to occur in his life. Saul is ready to repent. And you can look at his life and see that he does just that. And friend, for a person to be saved, they must change their way of thinking and change their way of acting. What if Saul of Tarsus heard the voice of Jesus, realized it was truth, and believed in Christ, and then went right out and started doing the things he'd been doing. Would that be a pleasing to God? Well, of course not. Did Paul have to stop persecuting Christians and turn to Christ and start serving Him? Absolutely. And friend, that's what repentance is. The Bible teaches one must repent to be saved. Acts 2 verse 38, the Scripture says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Is repentance essential for the remission of sins? Absolutely it is. Acts 3 verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. And of course, the example of Jesus. Luke chapter 13, certain people come to Jesus and really, it kind of looks like they want to elevate themselves and really they want to look down on other people. And so they say to Jesus, uh, what about these 18 people are walking down the road and a, out of nowhere a tower falls on them? In essence, they're saying, wasn't that God's vengeance on them? Or what about these people who had their blood mingle with their sacrifice? Wasn't that your divine wrath coming out on those people? You know what Jesus said in verse 3? 
and verse 5. Jesus completely ignores those people and He says this, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Repentance is not just crying a bunch of tears. It's not just being sorry. Godly sorrow produces repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. You can feel bad about sin. You can even be brought to the point of tears. You can feel sorrow over that. But if one doesn't change, he hasn't repented. For godly sorrow produces repentance. What does it produce? A changed way of life. That's what repentance is all about. I change my way of thinking and I change my way of acting and amend that to God's way of thinking and God's way of acting. And so Paul had to repent of those things he had done wrong. Was it necessary for Saul of Tarsus to confess Christ? You bet it was. Do you remember again Acts chapter 9, verses 5 and 6? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus who you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. And then Saul says, once he realizes who it is, Lord, what would you have me to do? to be right with you in essence. Saul had to confess Jesus as the Lord, as the Christ, as the Master and Savior of his life. And, and as we've already suggested, throughout the Scriptures you find that. Romans 10 verse 10, the Scripture says, with the heart, the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Must I confess with my mouth? Jesus is the Son of God, absolutely. Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, Neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Like the Ethiopian eunuch who boldly proclaimed, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So men and women today must realize Jesus is God's Son, the Savior of the world. But did Saul's conversion end there? Now remember, Saul at this point has heard the Word of God. At this point, Saul believes Jesus is the Christ now. He's been converted on the road to Damascus to who Christ is. He's willing to repent and make changes in his life. He's acknowledged the Lordship of Jesus and confessed Him. Are his sins washed away at this point? Not according to the Scripture. Now, remind you of the question. I remind you of the question in Acts chapter 9, verse number 6. Saul said, Lord, what would you have me to do. And here's Jesus' response. You go into the street called Straight, go to the house of Simon the Tanner and stay there and, I'll, and I'll, it'll be told you what you must do. The Lord said to him, I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. When do we find God telling Saul of Tarsus what he wanted him to do to be right with him? In Acts chapter 22 verse 16, God sends his servant Ananias directly to Saul with a message. Let's look at that message. Would you look in Acts chapter 22, verse number 16 with me? Paul or Saul recounts his conversion, and here's what Ananias and God said to Saul. Ananias comes and says, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? You go to this house, I'm going to tell you what you must do. Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, I want you to listen very carefully as we think about this very important subject. There's a, a host of ideas out there that are flat out wrong and are going to lead people to condemnation on the day of judgment as it relates to salvation. But what I want to focus on today is, does the Bible, and that's all we're worried about, does the Bible teach one must be baptized to have his sins washed away. Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins. Now listen carefully. Is it sin that separates a man from God? Isaiah answers that question for us. The God, God says through Isaiah in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, The Lord's ear is not heavy that He cannot hear, His arms not shortened that He cannot save, but your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. It is the case that sin separates a man from God. Now if that's true, and it is, then friend, if I can know the moment in time, the moment in conversion, when sins are removed, I can know exactly when a person's saved. When is that? Arise, be baptized. Listen now. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord.
The Bible doesn't teach baptism is just something good to do. The Bible doesn't teach it's an outward expression of inner grace, as some will say. The Scriptures teach a person, listen carefully now, the Scriptures teach a person cannot be saved before he's baptized. Are we saying you earn your salvation? Of course not. No different than hearing the Word, no different than believing in Jesus, no different than repenting of sin. It is a condition I must meet. But the Scripture says it is a condition essential to salvation. I'm not saved until my sins are washed away. When are my sins washed away? At the point of baptism. Now, this is not the only time the Bible teaches this. As we thought about cases of conversion in our last lesson, we looked at Acts chapter 2 and we thought about on the day of Pentecost, what for the very first time the gospel is preached, what were these men and women told to do? Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 2 verse 38. Listen to the harmony. Arise and be baptized, have your sins washed away. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Not believe alone, not be baptized alone. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. Friend, to illustrate that baptism is essential to salvation, let me remind you of this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 10 following teaches that salvation is in Christ. Imagine this circle represents Christ, and inside this circle where Christ is, is salvation. And I'm outside this circle. How do I get into Christ? Galatians 3.27 tells us, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Is it essential to be in Christ to be saved? Absolutely. How do you get in Christ? You're baptized into the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friend, I don't know that we could say it with any more clarity. Then 1 Peter 3.21 says, Baptism, listen now, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward, a, toward God. King James Version says, Baptism does now also save us. If the Bible says, Baptism does now also save us, in essence, baptism saves us, why would anybody dare say, Baptism is not essential to salvation. Again, are we saying that when I've been baptized, I can look up to heaven and say, God, I've done this work. You owe it to me. No, we're, it's not saying, we're not saying it's something you earn. Luke 17 says, 10 says, when you've done all those things, say, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that, which is, God's, which is my duty to do. I've only done that which God has required of me. Have I earned it? No. But is it necessary? Friend, believing. Did you know believing is a work of God? John 6, verse 29, Jesus said, This is the work of God that you believe on Him whom I sent. Some people say you can't say baptism is essential because then you're making a work and no work salvation. We're not saying it's a meritorious work by which you earn your salvation, but is it a conditional work? Is belief a conditional work? God said it was. Is baptism a condition I must meet to be saved? Absolutely. Can I earn salvation that way? No. By grace are you saved through faith. What's faith? It's an obedient trust and response to the will of God. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. It's as Peter said, the answer of a good conscience toward God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 21. And so friend, as we think today about cases of conversion in the New Testament, we look to the book of Acts because it's the book that tells one, what must I do to be saved? And friend, here's what we challenge you today with. We challenge each of ourselves with this. Each of us is responsible to look to the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Today, we ask you to stop for just a moment. And I want you to think about your own salvation experience, your own conversion. What did you do to be saved? Well, maybe somebody told you to say the sinner's prayer and you'd be saved. Where's that at in the Bible? Maybe somebody told you, all you've got to do is believe in Jesus to be saved. Well, you've seen faith only won't work. Maybe somebody told you something different. Whatever it was, all I'm asking you today is this. I want you to think about your own conversion experience. And while you hold that up clear in your mind, all we ask you to do is compare that with what we've seen in the Word of God today. Saul had to hear 
the message about Jesus? Have we listened to the Word of God and it alone? Saul had to believe Jesus was the Lord and the Christ. Do we believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? No man comes to the Father except by Him. John 14, 6. Saul had to change his way of life and not go back into his evil ways. Have we repented? According to Luke 13, 3. Saul confessed Jesus as the Lord and Savior of his life. Have we confessed Christ as Savior? And Saul arose and was baptized and had his sins washed away. Friend, have you done those things? This is a matter of supreme importance. If you haven't obeyed God's plan of salvation, we're not asking you to do what we say. That's inconsequential. We're asking you to do what the Bible says. And then if you do that, you'll know God's pleased with. We hope you'll study with us again as we study more about the cases of conversion in the New Testament. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.